In this lesson, we'll look at work done on a system by an external force. To do that, first we have to define what is our system. Previously, we had looked at a particle as being our system, so a single solid object so, such as a ball, for example. If we throw a ball into the air, uh, there are two forces acting on the ball while that happens. There's the applied force doing work, which is our hands pushing on the ball, and there's also the work done by the force of gravity. And we recognize this here as the work kinetic energy theorem that says the sum of the work done by all forces acting on the object is equal to the change in the kinetic energy of the object. When we define our system to be the ball alone, pretty much any force that acts upon the ball is going to be an external force. But if we change our system to say that our system includes the ball and the earth, now the gravitational force on the ball from the earth is now an internal force. And so when I say work done by external forces, now my hands pushing on the ball is the only external force. And of course, work done by external forces either adds or subtracts energy from the system. We know that positive work adds energy to the system and negative work takes energy away from the system. So either way, we have a change in the mechanical energy of the system. When we have more complex systems, over here just a ball by itself, the only uh, category of energy that we have uh, for the ball is kinetic energy. Now that we have a more complicated system, the ball and the earth together, we have more categories of energy. We have kinetic energy, energy of motion, but we also now can have potential energy. The work done by the external force is equal to the change in the mechanical energy of the system. It's just now that the mechanical energy for the more complicated system com is comprised of kinetic and potential energy, both. And in this example, we're neglecting the effects of the wind on the ball, the air resistance. In other words, we're treating this as a frictionless system. If this is a heavy ball, the effects of the wind at these low speeds is negligible, and we can basically say that this is a frictionless system. So in our frictionless system, the work done by external forces is equal to the change in the mechanical energy of the system. Now let's look at an example in which we do not neglect friction. We include friction. So uh, on a particle-like object, let's say a block. This block will push it across the table with constant force F, and while it is moving across the table, it also experiences a kinetic frictional force. Here's an example of a block sliding across a table pulled by a constant force. Let's start our analysis using Newton's second law. The sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. In the direction of the displacement, the x direction, there are two forces acting on the block the pulling force, F, and the kinetic frictional force, Fk, which opposes the motion. The motion is to the right, the pulling force is to the right, and the frictional force is to the left. So our sum of the forces is F in the positive direction, Fk in the negative direction, and that equals mass times acceleration. But I've taken my equation of motion, and I've solved it for acceleration, and I've inserted into the equation for acceleration the expression that I get from this equation of motion, solving for A. I'm going to cross multiply the 2D to the other side and multiply the D through the parentheses and divide both sides by the 2 then again. And now you'll recognize this as the work kinetic energy theorem that says the sum of the work done on the block by all forces is equal to the change in kinetic energy. You'll recognize this one-half mv final squared minus one-half mv initial squared as the change in kinetic energy. So now I move the fkd to the other side, and I see that the work done by the force f is equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the work done by the frictional force. And the work done by the frictional force converts the energy to heat. 
That's why we're calling it delta E thermal for uh, amount of energy in the form of heat. So before, without friction, we said work done by external forces on a particle-like object will result in a change in its kinetic energy. Now that we include friction, we say that work is equal to the change in kinetic energy and the heat generated by friction together. Let's look at a similar example, but now our force F is moving the block up a ramp instead of across a horizontal surface. So that introduces an, one additional force. Yes, I still have the pulling force. Yes, I still have the kinetic frictional force opposing the motion, but now my weight has a component that is in the direction or parallel to the direction of motion. And from this diagram, we can see that that is mg sine theta, where theta is the angle of the incline of the plane. So once again, we'll use Newton's second law. And now the sum of the forces is the sum of three forces, the pulling force F, the kinetic frictional force Fk, and the component of weight down the slope, mg sine theta. So there is my sum of forces. F is in the positive direction, and kinetic friction and the component of weight are in the negative direction, down the ramp. And once again, I'm going to use this expression that I got from working with the equations of motion and solving for A, and subbing into my equation for A this expression. I'll cross-multiply the D to the other side, and then I'll multiply the D through the parentheses, to get F times D, that will be the work done by the applied force F. Negative FKD will be the negative work done by the frictional force. And MG sine theta times D will be the negative work done by the gravitational force. And that equals the change in kinetic energy. Yes, that is the work kinetic energy theorem right there. Now I'll isolate FD, the work done by my applied force, and we see that it equals the change in kinetic energy plus MGD sine theta and FKD. But if we look at this triangle up here, we see that the sine of theta is equal to delta H over D, which means uh, D sine theta is equal to delta H. Here we see it right there. D sine theta uh, is equal to delta H. And so that means uh, I can replace delta H in my uh, expression for change in potential energy to be this. So when I look down here and I see MGD sine theta, I recognize that as my change in potential energy. So I can rewrite the equation as delta K plus delta U plus the thermal energy. So for work done by a force on a system where the elevation changes, now we have changes in kinetic energy, changes in potential energy, and generation of thermal energy from the friction. And we recognize kinetic and potential together as being the mechanical energy of the system. So we can come up with the same uh, expression we came up for the horizontal system, that the work done by the outside force, the external force, equals the change in mechanical energy plus the thermal energy generated. The difference here was mechanical energy in this example consisted of both kinetic and potential, where in the previous example, the mechanical energy only com was comprised of kinetic energy. This leads us to the law of conservation of energy. The total energy, E, of a system is the sum of its mechanical energy and its internal energies, which includes thermal energy. This total system energy can only change by amounts that are added to or subtracted from the system. This has been proven experimentally. So here's the equation that says this. W is the work done by an external force. Remember, work is the transfer of energy. So work done by an external force means that energy is being transferred to or from the system. And that change in the energy can fall into several categories. The mechanical energy could change. The thermal energy can change or some other form of internal energy can ch could change. For example, if something gets hot, it emits infrared radiation, and that is ener uh, light energy, radiated energy. Anyway, 
if there is no way energy can be transferred to or from the system, we say that that system is isolated. Internal transfers of energy can occur within an isolated system, but the total amount, which is the sum of all these here, the total amount will not, cannot change. Here's a kid's toy. It's got a spring and I can compress the spring and this little suction cup will hold it in place for a brief time and then it shoots up into the air. Here's a close-up view of my spring toy and the system that I'm going to be considering is the spring toy and earth together. They comprise my system. So my the force of my hand compressing the spring, that counts as an external force. I am not part of the system, so my force is an external force. And work done by my applied external force, we'll call the applied work, W sub A. And I push down on the spring toy, and the displacement of the toy is in the same direction, downward. So that means I am doing positive work. So I will change the mechanical energy of the system uh, by a positive amount. I will increase the energy of the system. And for a, a system of more than one particle, uh, in this case, the spring toy and the earth, we can have multiple categories of energy. And the categories of energy possible for our system are kinetic energy and potential energy, where potential energy consists of both spring potential energy and gravitational potential energy. So the amount of work I do, that energy is going to show up as an increase in these categories. But for this example, initially my toy is at rest. Over here, after I compress it, it's still at rest. So the change in kinetic energy is zero. But the spring potential energy has changed by one-half kx squared. Now that the spring is compressed at a distance x, the energy stored in it is one-half kx squared. And the change in the gravitational potential energy is a very small amount because this this height change was very small, but it did become less by mgh, where h is the height, and in this case, that's x, so mgx. So I see that now over here in the, on the right, the amount of energy stored in the spring is equal to the amount of energy that I added to the system plus the work that gravity did over this very small distance. Before the spring toy launches, the amount of energy in the system is all in the form of potential spring energy. The kinetic energy is zero, it's not moving, and if I, uh, and its height above my reference point is h equals zero. So both of these terms, kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy are zero, and the total mechanical energy in my system is just the energy stored in the spring. Then the spring launches, it goes to its highest point, and we know at that highest point, the velocity is briefly zero. So my kinetic energy category has no energy in that category. My gravitational potential energy now is mgh, and the spring is not, is not compressed anymore, of course, so the compression is zero. So now all of my mechanical energy exists solely in the gravitational potential energy category but the total amount is the same. So in other words, one half kx squared in the left picture is equal to mgh in the right picture. And if I look at an intermediate location, here we go somewhere in between, now the toy has both height and velocity. So the total mechanical energy, although the amount, the total amount hasn't changed, now some of it is in the kinetic en energy category, and some of it is in the gravitational potential energy category. Let's look at an example with some numbers. Let's drop a 0.3 kilogram block from rest from a height 30 centimeters above a spring that has a spring constant of 1,500 newtons per meter. We know it will compress some distance x. How much is that distance? Let's solve for x. So we can choose any two points we want throughout this motion, uh, and we know that the total mechanical energy at any two points will stay the same. 
energy will be conserved. So our categories of energy are kinetic energy, spring potential energy, and gravitational potential energy, and I've labeled them I for initial and F for final. I'm going to choose this lowest point that the spring compresses to as my reference point for height. And I'll, and I'll also use that location as my final position. And I'll choose my initial position as the starting point up here, uh, 30 centimeters above the spring. So at the beginning, it's not moving, so its kinetic energy is zero. The spring is not compressed at all, so there's no energy in the spring. All of the er energy exists as gravitational potential energy, uh, which we know is MGH, where H is my height above my reference point. So we see in this diagram that's 30 centimeters plus X. So there's my height above my reference point. Then at the lowest point, the spring compresses and briefly the block has no velocity. So its kinetic energy at the lowest point is also zero. The potential energy stored in the spring is one half kx squared. And because the block is now at my lowest position, there is no gravitational potential energy. So I'm going to multiply the mg through the parentheses here and uh, plug in my value for k. And I move this to the other side to set up a quadratic equation. I see that the spring is compressed 3.6 centimeters or 0 0.036 meters. Notice at no time in the problem did I need to know how fast the object was moving. By strategically choosing the highest point and the lowest point as my initial and final positions, at both of those positions, the object was at rest. So there was no kinetic energy. The intermediate values of kinetic energy, I don't need to know them to find out how far the spring was compressed. All right, let's summarize what we've learned here. If we have a system and there is an external force doing work to that system, it will change the mechanical energy. And if we do positive work, it increases the energy of the system. If we do negative work, it decreases the uh, mechanical energy of the system. And our mechanical energy consists of kinetic energy and potential energy. If there are no external forces, then the mechanical energy remains constant in a frictionless system. In other words, the mechanical energy at some time point one is the same as the mechanical energy at time point two. And again, the uh, categories of mechanical energy are kinetic and potential. And another way of saying that is the delta E mech equals zero. Or if we look at a system that has friction, energy is still conserved, but now some of the mechanical energy may become thermal energy. So initially, our initial amount of mechanical energy at time point one, later at time point two, there is mechanical energy plus thermal energy. And another way of looking at that is the mechanical energy at some t later time point is equal to the mechanical energy I had initially minus the amount of energy that became heat. And yet another way of looking at it is to rearrange the equation to say the delta mechanical, the change in the mechanical energy plus the change in the thermal energy adds to zero.